Chile, half a world and another hemisphere away. This slender sliver of a country boasts over 3,000 miles of coastline, and ah, who am I kidding with a Lonely Planet recap? I gotta come clean. I knew pretty much zero about this place, aside from some semi-formed impressions based on my obsession with the Nixon-era CIA and their involvement in this country's 1973 military coup. But over the course of a week, my fuzzy preconceptions gave way to a more fully formed and complex picture of a country coming to terms with its past and looking out at possible futures. As simply a landscape, it's gorgeous. I'm Anthony Bourdain. That's right. I write, I travel, I eat, and I'm hungry for more. On the morning of Tuesday, September 11, 1973, Chilean military forces covertly backed by the CIA and the Nixon White House attacked Chile's democratically elected government. Columnist Pablo Uneas was in Santiago that morning. I was exactly in this corner in uh, September 1973 when the first Hawker Hunter sent a bomb through the palace. And it's impression you can never forget, no matter what side you are. Within hours, the plotters, led by Army General Augusto Pinochet, had pulled off a successful coup, and President Salvador Allende was dead. For the next 17 years, Pinochet ruled over Chile with what could charitably be referred to as an extremely firm hand. Anyone viewed as a threat to the government, both at home and abroad, risked being subjected to arrest, torture, disappearance, and death. We're talking about 3,000 people that are over 17 years. Disappeared. Disappeared or tortured uh, uh, by the military or the secret police. The coup was a military solution to a political problem. That should have been solved with a plebiscite or whatever, but the military solution to problems creates more trouble. Strangely enough, many people I spoke to were measured in their evaluation of a man whose name became synonymous with torture, murder, and despotism. But Chile is all about a country that wants to move forward. Over the past two decades, this country's risen to the rank of economic powerhouse of South America. A prosperous country moving headlong into a new century proud of the brighter aspects of its past, yet eager to move forward. Need proof? Check out this place. Fuente Alamana, or the German Fountain. Named for this giant bronze thing, this scary looking monster sitting across the street. A gift from Germany commemorating the centennial of Chile's independence from Spain. For 60 years, this downtown institution has been kind of the place for hungry Santaguinos to gorge themselves on this. This iconic standard bearer of everyday Chilean gastronomy, this towering monument all its own, a heaping pile of pork and avocado called the Lomito. You know, this is my first day here. You know, long before I arrived the, on the internet, Chileans are going, the show's coming here, you have to eat this, you have to eat this, you have to, there's certain things that are absolutely fundamental to kind of everyday Chilean life. This will be one of them. You say in your show that you've eaten a Lomito in the Fuente Alemana, and the people will say in Chile, he's one of ours. Oh, OK, good. That's really important to me. And this thing is important to Chileans. Although there are different variations of it, the classic Lomito at Fuente Alamana starts with a fresh-baked frica bun slathered with a fist-sized dollop of avocado, some fresh tomatoes, and a generous, perhaps too generous, helping of mayonnaise. And of course, you can't overlook the pork. Literally, even if you try. Freshly sliced into a still steaming heap. Look at it. Yeah, it's beautiful. And of course, a frothy mug of the house beer. 
Muchas gracias. That's a noble looking sandwich. Look at it. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, yes. Beautiful. Yes, but how about the taste? Delicious. I think this is the best contribution of German immigration to our nation. Beer and Beer the sandwich. And German cuisine. Mm -hmm. As uncomfortable as I am with all things Hofbrau-esque, with lederhosen of any stripe or nationality, I'm unconflicted in my love for this sandwich. In the words of that titan of music and hair design, Mr. Wayne Newton, I can only say, Danke schön. My belly filled with a slurry of pork, avocado, mayo, and beer, I figure it's time for a little caffeinated pick-me-up. This is the Paseo Mal, the, the main artery of Chilean downtown. The Paseo Ahumada. Kind of like Las Ramblas in Barcelona, it's a pedestrian-only retail and commercial artery running right through downtown Santiago. Everything that happens, happens here. And that's where you find Café Caribe, one of many examples of a particularly Chilean phenomenon known as Café con piernas, or coffee with legs. This was not a coffee culture. It was a Nescafe culture. So when did it start here? In the 50s. And people wouldn't care much for coffee, but they did care for good-looking senoritas. The idea was to invent something that had both stimulus, a nice-looking lady, and what invigorates your mind. And so the coffee with legs phenomena was not only born, but even thrived during the repressive Pinochet years. But as far as your servers go, the level of dress or undress runs the whole spectrum. Frankly, there's something decidedly, I don't know, creepy about this. I mean, I'm trying to have my morning coffee here. I don't want the guy next to me at the counter spanking his monkey. And don't even get me started on the footwear. And the heels are tough. Tough, tough to work in heels. You know, she's wearing stilettos over there. Her feet must hurt at the end of the day. I've never worn high heels. It must be terrible. Yeah, me neither. Definitely. Just want to get that clear right now. And while the Café Con Piernas phenomena shows no sign of fading, it's suddenly having to share space with a new player on the coffee house scene. The corporate café behemoth Starbucks has started making serious inroads into the Chilean market which brings with it a whole other set of lifestyle issues to suffer through. You know the show Friends? This, this ruined the whole coffee culture to me. They, they, they want to live this bizarro, alternate reality like they see on that show, sit around on couches. How can you drink coffee for two hours, an hour? No, no, no. It is just long. See, this is perfect for me. You stand at a counter, have your coffee, you go, no big deal. I mean, it's, it's only coffee at the end of the day. A little fetishism with your coffee? No, thank you. After some caffeine and a little time to walk off the pork-tastic Lamido, there's only one logical thing to do. Eat more pork. So I'm hanging out with my friend and Santiago resident Raul Pino in the Estacion Central neighborhood. For almost a hundred years, this working-class neighborhood has been home to yet another holy place on the world tour of pork-related destination dining. El hoyo, what does that mean? El hoyo, that means the hole. It's like when you say, it's a hole in the wall. What, what, are, they, what are they known for here? The pernils. And here, pernil is uh, the leg of the pork, pork leg right. right. And that is cooking here to perfection. Ah, so that's the thing to do. Yeah. One of several must-haves here at Aloyo and a staple of Chilean cuisine. Picture this, pig fans. An entire leg of pork simmered for hours in light brine till falling off the bone tender. And then this, this arroyado, a tube, a loaf of cured pork and bits wrapped in pork skin and boiled and served by the slice. Delicious beyond imagining. Usually people eat half of it and take the rest home because it's great for sandwich. But before this porcine throwdown happens, perhaps a little palate cleansing libation to get things started. Ah. Behold the terremoto or earthquake. This is the earthquake? Yep. White wine? Uh huh. And, uh, and pineapple ice cream. Is this a cocktail for before the meal or you drink this straight through? Uh, before and then if you get happy, you'll be drinking more. Mm, cheers. Salud. Salud. I mean, it's just wine and pineapple juice, right? So how come it gets you almost immediately ripped, transported to faraway fields of pork-scented flowers, glistening varietal meats and bursting sausages, 
Huh? What? Where am I? No, you're right. I'm getting happy already. And the happiness is just beginning. Cue the pork products. Whoa, this is an impressive hunk of meat. Summon back to reality, but a vision even better than my dreams. A moist, potentially explosive blood sausage. Oh, it's nice and soft. All right, so, I'm gonna mash up a little of this in there, huh? See, this is just perfect happiness for me. It just the arrival of an unexpected blood sausage is, you know, it's like, you know, true love. You never know it's gonna happen until it happens. And this is one of those rare uh, instances where I really don't have an opinion. I could just eat this like candy, or I could mix it up with the mashed potatoes. Either way, I'm really, really happy. Glad you showed up, my friend. But we're not done yet. Meet the mysterious and wonderful Arroyado. Holy jeebus, this is just fiendishly delightful looking. Oh, yeah. This is truly unique. I haven't seen anything like this before. That's, this, is, this is a really wonderful innovation. I'm not walking away from this table. I'm waddling away. Andrew Zimmer is going to look like a svelte little ballerina by the time I'm through with this meal. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll be rolling out of here, but I'll be in good company because there are two things that are never in short supply at El Oyo, pork and legions of loyal and satisfied customers. What a joy. Just like sensational. Thanks for that, man. Hey. Cheers. Cheers, honey. No, one more. One more little bit of this blood sauce. That. <laughs> Only one day in Chile, and this country's already going down smoother than that fourth pitcher of terremotos. Horses? I love horses. Boots, saddles, and spurs sounds like a party. It's rodeo, the number two most popular sport in Chile behind soccer. What's number three? Evading itinerant rodeo poets, a growing menace everywhere these days. Coming up. Santiago. At the Estación Central, commuters are coming in, travelers are heading out. While some of the locals are clearly abuzz over the exciting arrival of a certain celebrity chef and author, Raul and I can't be bothered. We're taking a train south to explore one of Chile's biggest cultural phenomena. Just south of Santiago, sandwiched between the Andes and the coastal range, lies Chile's Central Valley, a fertile region of mile after mile of orchards and vineyards, Chile's Fruit Bowl. Raul and I are headed into the heart of the largest wine-producing region of the country, the Corico Valley. A good bottle of Chilean wine is not expensive. You can buy a $10 bottle of wine and an excellent quality. Now you go to a $17 and you're drinking something that you would not drink in California or in France. I noticed the best restaurants in Sao Paulo, in Buenos Aires, in Montevideo. They would offer Chilean wine first over French or California. But it's not some Chilean version of Sideways. No vineyard tour. We came to the Carrico Valley to witness not only the national sport, but a national obsession. So we're going to the rodeo today. Which is not the typical rodeo, especially for you from the United States. And Raul knows his rodeo, and he should. His father was a champion rider. So the rodeo here started because during the spring, the farmers had to send their cattle up to the mountains. And then at the beginning of the fall, they would send their cowboys, wassos, to get them back. Is this a sport appreciated by everyone, like city people and country people? Oh, yes. Really? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We're not riding, are we? We could. <laughs> Four hours south of Santiago at the Waso and Rodeo Club of Curico, the action is just getting started. Rodeo fans from around the region come to this arena to check out the riders, buy new wares, and of course, eat. So that place looked good over there. And whether you're the owner of a riding team, a local fan, or a semi-toothless drunken poet, one thing's true for everyone. Whatever you eat, you will be eating well. At a Chilean rodeo, the quality of the food is often as good as the quality of the riders themselves. Raul and I are kicking back and enjoying some traditional fare and some of the famous local Chilean wine. 
I suddenly, uh, in my 50s, I'm drinking a lot of wine. Never before. What is, is the time in our life when we really know what is good and we enjoy it more? Before we, we did something because we thought it was good, now we mm -hmm. know that it's good. No. I like to think you're right. I think you are right. No. Words of wisdom, Raul, and we don't waste any time putting them to the test with this first dish, plateara picapa. Little bite-sized cubes of braised brisket. Goes well with the wine. This is uh, it's beef, and it's cooked on the boil. Scooped, braised. It's very tender. Yeah. This is delicious. Mm, good fat. And I think the wine goes very well with this. Yeah, really well. And, oh, that looks good. Then look, more red wine and more meat. Beef ribs braised in local wine. Carmenet, a cousin of Merlot, if you care. That, that's not what I expected at all, in a good way. I, I thought I'd be gnawing on a, on a barbecued rib bone. That's, that's sexy. The main ingredient is carmenet wine. Right. And then they boil the bones. They make a stock. They make a stock. Right. Because this is very much, it, it's like a coq au vin. It's a very similar sauce, beautiful. Mm. Delicious. They're paired with a favorite starch in Chile called charquicon, a variation of mashed potatoes that also incorporates pumpkin, celery, and spinach. So this will be classic, typical, very typical, uh, well, it makes sense, wine country. It's a very whiny dish. All in all, not even close to what I'd imagine lunch at a rodeo would be, but then this is clearly not your typical rodeo. But this style of riding, and in fact, this form of rodeo, the, the, the whole sport, is based directly on on the everyday working horses. Yes, they ride about six different horses. They yeah, I guys. should have three or four different rides. I should have three or four different people doing this show. <laughs> I can just sit over there, drink wine, eat my ribs, have a good time. I wouldn't have to worry about the cameras. Perhaps I've stumbled onto the secret of the perfect season of No Reservations. Stunt doubles. Belly, drunk off my ass, time to watch some cattle stunned into submission. What's the most popular spectator sports in Chile? Soccer. Soccer. Number one. Number one. Number two? Rodeo. They ride in teams of two, called a corriera. The idea, as I understand it, is to lead the calf around the corral and pin him up against a cushion wall. Who do people tend to root for? They, they root for the best. Who they think is yeah. the best. Yes. And in Chilean rodeo, the best is determined by how well the calf is pinned. Pinning it closer to its hindquarters, four points. Pinning it closer to its head, zero points. As good a national sport as any other, I guess, but after an hour of it, with the dull thud of prime beef being tenderized against a wall still ringing in my ears, I'm ready to hit the dining tent again. They've got every type of produce known to man, delicious local delicacies. Good stuff. And a lot of meat. Okay. It's good times at La Vega Central. Yeah! <laughs> and we come back. Another day, another show, another market scene. Bienvenido a Chile, Bienvenido. But not just any market. Filmmaker Jorge Sotomayor is showing me around this Santiago institution for some local flavor and a lot of food. This market is La Vega Central. This is a market that was founded more than 100 years ago. La Vega Central, back in the Estación Central neighborhood. A pretty staggering abundance of very, very good looking produce from all around Chile. Aisle upon aisle of fresh fruits and produce, fresh meat, fish, all the usual suspects. He can leave you feeling, well, really freaking hungry. I need a snack. This is called the sopapillas. It's a food from the Mapuche Indian. Sopapillas, mashed pumpkin, wheat flour, pressed flat and fried in lard. What's not to like? Good stuff. 
Dat is het Great, but what if I'm feeling thirsty and hungry? This is something very ancient. It's mote con huesillo, which is cooked barley with peaches. This is very indigenous, but it's been spread all over the country. I've never, never seen anything like it. it. Mm. Ever since I was a little kid, this was my favorite treat. Good? Good. <laughs> all this amazing fresh stuff has got me craving something more. We're heading over to a favorite spot of Jorge's at the Mercado for some local fare of a more substantial variety. Across the street from La Vega Central is La Vega Chica. A smaller area filled with casual lunch counters and sit-down eateries. The preferred dining option of vendors and market customers alike. This is Carmen's. Carmen's is typical of the best of this place. No signage indicating it even is Carmen's. People know to come here because they know. And because everybody's been coming here for years. Because it's Carmen's. Right, here we go. They come here for this. Caldo pata, or hoof soup. So that's very pretty. Exactly what you'd expect, only better. Cow foot, vegetables, cilantro, cooked in hearty broth. Mm. Texture is lovely. Everybody, it seems, all great cooking cultures do some version of this. This is a country with a rapidly emerging middle class. And I guess what happens when you see people kind of newly entering the middle class, they turn their backs on dishes oh, like yes. this. It's like an embarrassment. I, I never had to eat it. I have no idea what you're talking about. But you, but you miss it anyway. Another little gem that may have fallen out of favor with some, chunchules, basically deep-fried chitlins. Well, so that looks like the large intestine. Served with mashed potatoes and rice. That's good. Generally not one of my favorite things, but this is good. And finally, the famous see it everywhere in one form or another, pastel de choclo, or Chilean corn pie. A super dense, sweet, savory layering of ground beef, chicken, egg, and cornmeal and herb baked in casserole. So it's shepherd's pie. Yep. <laughs> it is. Yeah, that's what it is. So that's lunch. This is really nice mix. Mm. Dishes like this, served in a setting like La Vega Chica, give you probably the best window in what a country and a culture are like. Well, there's just a place like this to sit down and eat interesting stuff. Plus the colors, plus the smells. It's great people watching, because uh, you really kind of get a sense of the heart and soul of a, of a country. Who lives in this place and kind of what are they like? This is uh, exciting, always. A lot has changed since the bad old days of the Pinochet era, and in many ways, the country is unrecognizable from its repressive past. Economic prosperity and civil freedoms have allowed for a rebirth of Chilean culture. There's a vibe in countries that have emerged fairly recently from repressive times. Countries that have always had it pretty good are pretty boring. You know, Scandinavian countries, I'm just like, uh, not, not interesting. I haven't been in Chile uh, as it was before. You can tell that uh, really people have some sort of a power to, I wouldn't say control the politicians, but uh, certainly influence them. People have the power. And it's been a long and hard fought struggle, but as we approach the coast, the real question for me anyway is, when am I gonna get some seafood? Obviously not before this. It's 12 hot inches of throbbing meat in tube form. Oh my God, holy jeebus. It's Chile's obscenely oversized, overloaded Uber dog. And oh my God, it's coming closer. West of Santiago, hugging the central coast and Jorge's Jag, we're on a mission for fresh seafood. But along the way, Jorge says there's one staple in Chilean gastronomy I just can't miss. And so we find ourselves in the resort town of Viña del Mar at Sibaritico's, a garage-turned hot dog emporium. 
where size definitely matters. Two, completo. Yeah. The complete one is with chucrut, uh, mayonnaise. What's the classic? <laughs> Whoa, hombre, that is 12 freaking inches of floppy clown shoe right there. The origins of this all beef wonder wiener remain shrouded in mystery. And what of the name, Completo? What makes it complete? Basically a big Basically hot dog. a big hot dog, hot dog in a big bun, right? Then, see, he puts chucrut. Sauerkraut. Sauerkraut. The pickles, the uh, pickle pickles. vegetables. Chopped pickle vegetables. Tomato. Tomato. But I have a pound of guacamole. <laughs> and it all gets topped off with a copious, some might say excessive, slathering of mayo. Oh my wow. God, it's enormous. Man. <laughs> Every great nation has sort of a hot dog variation. Yeah, all their own. This is the biggest. This is not even close. You eat these all the time, right? All the time, man. <laughs> Twice a week. Oh, dude, <laughs> that is wild. And we're going to need a whole bunch of these. <laughs> what does one say to a terrifying Ron Jeremy-esque tube of meat like this adrift on a sea of avocado and mayo? I don't know whether to eat this thing or conceal it in a brown paper bag. Oh. You're gonna flank this thing. But the idea is that you get the whole, the whole taste of it all. The whole cross section. Yeah. Oh my God. I mean, how drunk do you have to be to eat the whole thing? <laughs> Holy jeebus. Now, Chris, I make the dog a little crisp. I cook the dog on a griddle, so it'll get a little crispy on the outside. It would be better. Yeah. But tradition is so much so that uh, they, don't, they won't do it. This is much It's, it's got to be like this. All right, one more. I feel like Terra Patrick mid-shift. Holy God. As impressive and curiously shamefully delicious as this mutant doggy might be, there's only so much of it I can choke down. I'm done. Yeah, me too. But there's no rest to be had here. Jorge drives us on from Vina to the famous port city of Valparaiso. It's new, it's very old, it's a port city and a UNESCO World Heritage Site for obvious reasons once you look around. Jorge takes me down to the Mercado del Puerto for a gape at the day's catch. At Don Vittorio's Seafood, the specials of the day reflect the benefits of being this close to the source. Abalone, razor clams, mussels, conger eel, everything here spent last night in the Pacific. Yeah, this, this'll work. Today, we're digging into some typical Chilean favorites. The classic razor clams with cheese, some fried conger eel, and a heavenly seafood stew called mariscal. I'm gonna go for one of these first. Okay. First up, machas con parmesan, or razor clams with cheese. Pan roasted with butter and cheese. You see these little buggers everywhere. Those are great. You wouldn't think clams and cheese would go together so well. Ooh, and this is the conger eel? That's the conger eel. Fresh conger eel, lightly battered and fried. Mmm. Delicate. Super fresh, too. I'm not kidding. All right, maybe just one more of these. We're not done yet. In the kitchen, a tiny treasure trove of shellfish goodness is bubbling away. Mussels, abalone, scallops, razor clams, and shrimp cooked in shellfish stock. You're gonna like this. Ah, Johnny. That's beautiful. Oh, look, we have all sorts of treasures. All in there. sorts of treasures. Mm. Just look at that. Steve was not overcooked, and they really take it serious. I mean, they put a lot of work into this. Yeah, this, they is, do. This, this is not just some kind of. Yeah, right. You know, just the broth alone would be the sensational, broth. too. Broth I just, just drink that in a glass. My, my, my grandmother used to say, the taste is in the stew. The lady who did it is just waiting behind you to see what your face is. That's delicioso. Amor rico. Simple preparation and straight out of the water fresh seafood. It doesn't take much to make this stuff taste great. But fresh seafood alone isn't what makes this city special. 
What sets Valparaiso apart is the very city itself. No longer the dominant Pacific shipping hub it once was, the city has seen a renaissance in recent years, spurred on by its growing status as a cultural center that set this place apart from any other urban space in Chile. You see it in the hillside houses and the labyrinthine streets, the open square, the busy port, a mix of prosperity, poverty, decay, and re-emerging grandeur. It's not so much seen as it's felt. In other words, you either get it or you don't. And one place that typifies this intangible charm is Bar La Playa, a hundred-year-old sailor bar located a few blocks from the port. I'm thinking, okay. what a typical end of the day drink. You know, I'll put in a okay. hard day at the office, shoveling food into my face. Good food, but but no small amount of it. <laughs> I'm thinking, so, um, how about a pisco sour? Yes. Okay. Yes, I think that sounds like a planet. The pisco sour before? Oh, yes, the ubiquitous pisco sour, a drink found all over Chile. A light, frothy mix of pisco, a type of brandy made from local grapes, lime juice, and simple syrup. Hey. Cheers. Hey. Too hard day's work. <laughs> That's good, but I'll tell you something. I'm guessing. Back in the day when this was a bar filled with brawny, drunken sailors, if we'd ordered this, we'd have got the kicked out of us. Oh, you bet. Yeah. Yeah, I would have ended up dead in an alley dressed up in women's clothes. The Pisco Sour. Next time, I'll have a beer. <laughs> Near the end of the world as we know it, a beautiful nowhere. A place to really get away and maybe stay away. Anytime you hear the words hot tub related injury, clearly life is not sucking, right? Patagonia, right after this. Somewhere near where the continent itself drops away and the country of Chile breaks up into a series of archipelagos and fjords, there's a gateway, an end and a beginning. Magellan named this area Patagonia after a mythical race of giants he believed to have roamed this astonishingly beautiful and rugged land. If I've learned anything in my decades of traveling and misbehaving, it's that if you go far enough to the end or the edges of anywhere, you're gonna find some ex-hippies. Vicki Johnson and Greg Locke wound up here. First building and then running this place. The rather incredible, eco-friendly, cliffs preserve Patagonia. Six very comfortable lodges, a clubhouse and spa facing an absolutely stunning, wild and beautiful ocean. It, it is a ridiculously beautiful location. I checked my email. That was the most strenuous thing I, I, I did this morning. It was really kind of the only reminder of the rest of the world. It's like Monterey in the 60s, only even wilder. The culmination of a long, strange trip. When you first came here, there was no road. This, no road. No, there, was, there was no road. No road. What, do you hike out here or what? what? means of conveyance to get out here. It, it, it was summer, so we came in a Jeep, then basically bushwhacked our way through the whole property, finding finding different spots to see it from. And it took us about two years to get the road built, the initial road to come in, and um, and then bring the water, the power, and then gradually we, we started building one cabin, two cabins, three cabins. To, to as much of an extent as possible, as I understand it, you're growing your own stuff. Yep. Uh, you're raising your own animals. Yep. yep. I'm, I'm guessing working with local fishermen. Absolutely. You're not flying in, you know, frozen Maine lobster nope. tails. No. Nope. Every five-star resort deserves a five-star restaurant. And the chow here is decidedly not tofu snacks with lentils and burdock. You got your fresh local ingredients used for this beautiful version of steak a la polvere. Sirloin beef, chilowain potatoes, and yes, quail eggs all off the property. Mm. This 
first pan-roasted conger eel right off the boat from a nearby fisher dude. And this Chilean version of polenta called chuchoca from corn grown, you guessed it, right down the trail a ways. Mmm. Wow, that's delicious. It's light, flaky. If you, if you didn't call it eel, if you called it Chilean snapper, this would be the hottest menu item in New York. Never in my life did I imagine in my wildest dreams that I would find myself having that to my right and that to my left and, and smelling that and feeling that as I walk back to this <laughs> extraordinary residence. What do we have to do to not f this up? It's really simple. What do we have to do? We need to be humble with our actions and we need to have a clean heart. You know, if, you're, if your heart's clean and you have the right intention, you'll, re you'll reach the objective. One might easily find oneself lulled into a state of blissful catatonia, the kind of near brain death piece where a six hour long bootleg of the Grateful Dead sounds like a fascinating afternoon's distraction, when nothing could be more interesting than a bright, shiny object or the trails left by your moving hand, man. Which might explain what happened to our editor, Dave, who accompanied us on a sort of fact finding mission to the field, or at least that was the pretense. I mean, this kind of says it all about, uh, uh, about this place is that our editor had a jacuzzi-related accident today. The guy who's editing this show, apparently he was getting out of his seaside jacuzzi this, this morning or last night, Todd. Okay. Were you guys in there together in a non-gateway? Yes. OK. So you guys were discussing the final cut of the show, and our editor apparently took a little bit of a drunken tumble down the hill. And, and what, he's limping? He's all gimped out. Anytime you hear the words hot tub related injury, clearly life is not sucking, right? Got to get some footage of that. I'm very upset with you, Todd, that you didn't have the camera with you. Priceless views, luxurious accommodations, wood burning jacuzzis. Yeah, I think I'm starting to hear the siren song myself. Before too long, it's Birkenstocks and fish downloads and where's my poncho? <laughs> like seafood? Hey, I know I do. How about mountains and, like, volcanoes? Sure. Well, then, what about seafood in the mountains with, like, volcanoes nearby? Awesome, right? If you don't understand that, you are going to die. That's the point. Well, maybe. Let's find out. That'll be great. It's my last day in Chile and my last chance to shove enough seafood on my face as humanly possible. And a good place to start is right here. About 45 minutes east of the cliffs Patagonia is the village of Puerto Montt. Like many of the towns in the Chilean Lake District, this inland port boasts a heavy Germanic influence. And this village's location on Relon Cavi Sound means this market boasts a heavy array of seafood. Sea urchin, hermit crabs, local cheeses, fish of every variety, and of course, snacks. Ready? Mmm. Oh, that's good. I'll have another one of those. Mmm. Wow, oh, that's the greatest stuff on earth. Squeeze first. Bitter. Mmm. <laughs> Oh, that's a belly bomb. Cool, huh? But these treats have only stoked my appetite. So I'm heading over to the neighboring village of Puerto Varas to get a bigger seafood fix. Situated on the shore of the crystalline Lake Yankee Way, this picturesque little alpine town is like something straight out of the sound of music. My friend Alfredo, a local innkeeper of sorts, meets me at Donde El Gordito, which translates, I believe, to where's the little fat guy? What should I drink? I think that's the first uh, thing. Probably you know about that. You've heard about a pisco sour in this country, of course. Yeah, I had a few of those last night. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a uh, glass of wine. White wine, wine yeah. Yeah, white wine sounds yeah. good. Pisco sour? Nah. That'll be great. So who lives in this community, in this town? Large expatriate community? Yes. A, a fairly sizable German population still? Yes, still. If you have to consider that they created this area. Right, now as I understand it, they were essentially invited to come clear the land. Yes. 
yeah, yeah. kill the indigenous people and set. Maybe, of course. Maybe that's a simplistic way to put it, but... But it, it was the way. But on the other hand, that influence is still here. If you go around this Jankiwa Lake, you can find different places where they still have the same concept in terms of German style, German uh, way of life. Strong German influence in the food? Of course. Luckily, there's no schnitzel or lederhosen on the agenda today. Corvina is kind of the king of fish around here, and at Gordito, they saute it and then bury it in a super rich salpicon of king crab legs. Oh, wow. Corvina with the king crab sauce. Smothered in a decadent crab and cognac cream sauce. And that's skimping on the crab. Well, well done. But after a few days in Chile, I've come to realize that finding incredibly fresh seafood here is kind of like finding chlamydia at Burning Man. It's pretty much everywhere you look. And with a virtually endless demand for seafood worldwide, it's a huge source of revenue and theoretically a renewable one as well. Theoretically. 20, 30 years ago, they found that the waters here were perfect for our fish farming. Yeah. And they got the farms very close to each other. The, the fish get sick in one penned area and it spreads very easily to the others. Yes. Do they treat the fish with antibiotics? Or yes, a lot of genetic, a lot of uh, antibiotics, a lot of proteins, extra proteins. On balance though, I mean, the fish farming probably help modernize, educate, clothe, house uh, generations of children. I mean, what do you think? Can you make a distinction as simple as fish farming, good or bad? It doesn't matter where, what is the activity. Uh, you have to create it and working on that sustainable. It's not a moral question, it's a practical question. It's a practical I mean, question. You're not going to no. have a business no. in a few years if you keep... You, yeah, if you produce organic, you can ask for more prime. Then you can farm fish organically. Of course. I think there is a huge hope in the future. And if you talk with my daughter, for example, she's only 17, she thinks about working every day for fulfill her desires. It's a kind of attitude. You have to work. Nobody's gonna give you something for free. And that is a heritage from the Pinochet time. You have to work. A drive born out of tough times pushes Chile to solve its problems and move forward. In many ways, it's already way out in front. What's good for a country in the short run and in the long is something Chile in particular has had to come to terms with. What's for sure is that nobody else should decide for them. What's also sure is that it's one of the most beautiful places I've been. Where so much went bad, so many things are now better than ever. Oh, that's delicious. Yeah. It's nice down here. And it tasted good. Just watch out for the hot dogs.